morning, everyone, and welcome to Dr. Roby's presentation. Um, it is my greatest pleasure to welcome her. She's one of my favorite people to work with. Um, a little bit about Dr. Roby. She has her Bachelor's of Arts from Drake University, uh, brings an extensive um, work experience that definitely we all benefit from, as well as completed her Doctor of Medicine at Quillen College of Medicine and has now joined us and is a third year in our psychiatry program. I promised her to keep it short and sweet and not embarrass her, so I'm gonna turn it over to her right now. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Tadapali. Good morning. Thank you guys for braving the weather this morning and coming out to spend a little time with me. Um, I love that extensive work history. I think that's code for I'm older than most people. <laughs> um, I, so this is, I, most of you guys know, this is part of a scholarly requirement that we have as third year residents um, to pick a topic and present it in grand rounds. And I'm always interested in what makes a resident choose a certain topic. So I'll tell you that in just a minute. But before we start, if you can clearly hear the sound of my voice, please raise your right hand. Okay, we are starting off good. Some of you raised your left hand. I'm not sure what to make of that, but I'm going to assume it's not a hearing problem, maybe a listening problem. But we'll... All right, so, <laughs> so today we're going to talk about palliative medicine and how it relates to psychiatry. Um, any of you who've spent any time with me know that I am passionate about palliative care. Um, I didn't know anything about it until I was a med student here at Quillen and got the opportunity to rotate with a palliative care specialist named Dr. David uh, Baumrucker in Kingsport. And it kind of changed everything about my perspective with regard to palliative care and how we can use it um, in our patient population. Now, I'm interested in a lot of things. I'm passionate about a lot of things. So why palliative for Grand Rounds? Um, also, many of you know that I lost my father on the third day of this academic year, on July 3rd, after a long fight with pulmonary fibrosis. So that was the point that this topic came into sharp focus for me because I was able to really see firsthand um, from a family member of a patient just the powerful and wonderful experience that a palliative care team can bring to a patient and to their family um, and ultimately even hospice care in the end. So it really kind of came sharp into focus about the same time that I was exploring my topic. So began to really look at how palliative care related to psychiatry because I found in my experience, at least with my father, that they were, um, there were a lot of things about psychiatry that were inherently palliative. So I decided to explore the relationship and then found as I got down that rabbit hole that there were quite a few other questions that I thought were kind of thought provoking that we don't always talk about. So we're gonna do that today. So we're gonna jump in the intersection where palliative and psychiatry meet. But first, the business, unless if any of you are feeling overly generous, I do not anticipate any financial gain or uh, reward today, nor do I have any commercial interests. Okay, let's establish what we know about palliative first. So just a little bit of true and false, and this is um, kind of a serious topic, so I need you guys to help me. I'm going to do some audience participation. I'm not on TV, so you can talk to me. Um, true or false, just shout it out. If you accept palliative care, you must stop all other treatment. False. Very good, that is false. Palliative care is the same as hospice in that it deals with end of life stage illness. False. So that is also false. Electing palliative care isn't an option for many patients though because it is more expensive than usual treatment options. False. It's actually false. Palliative care shortens life expectancy. Do we see a pattern here? I think you're catching on. All right, and there isn't need for palliative care because the primary doctor on the team will address my pain and other needs anyway. False. False. Um, believe it or not, you guys did pretty good on that, but these are really common misconceptions in the general population about palliative care, and that none of them are true. So the World Health Organization's definition for palliative medicine is that it improves the quality of life of patients and their families facing the problems associated with life-threatening illness through the prevention and relief of suffering by means of early identification and impeccable assessment and treatment of pain and other physical, psychosocial, and spiritual problems. So what does it do? So palliative can do a whole lot, and we don't always even realize the extent of it. It's going to provide pain and relief from distressing symptoms. It affirms life and regards dying as a normal process. And we don't always do death and dying very well in our culture. Um, palliative helps with that. 
but it intends neither to hasten nor postpone death. It offers a support system that really helps patients live as actively as possible until their demise, and it gives the family a support system to cope through the entire thing, and that's definitely something that I experienced firsthand. It's a team approach, and really its entire purpose is to enhance quality of life, and it can actually positively influence the course of an illness. Um, it's applicable early, right in the beginning of any, when a patient is diagnosed with any disease process known to be life limiting. Um, and can, should, can and should be used in conjunction with other therapies that are intended to prolong life. Oftentimes palliative is confused with hospice and it's brought in at the very end. Um, but that's not actually its greatest utility. So this is not linear. We don't treat this, um, patients with life-limiting illnesses, at least we shouldn't, in a linear way. Um, it's not disease-modifying therapy and then we reach a certain point and it's all palliative after that. These two treatments should be used in conjunction and this is a good way to look at that. So over the course of time from diagnosis, obviously you would expect a greater focus on mod disease-modifying therapy. And then as the disease progresses, it does move into more palliative, but the two should be in conjunction pretty much the entire time. Um, some benefits here, you know, obviously we've I mentioned some of these, but improvements in symptom burden, improved quality of life, improved mood, improved psychosocial status, improvements in survival, and reductions in cost. This is such a common misconception. Um, palliative can actually do both of these things. Um, quote here from Brewster et al., a study in 2016 says, evidence suggests that early palliative care in conjunction with disease-oriented treatment can profoundly affect the trajectory of illness by improving quality of life and mood and decrease, decreasing aggressive end-of-life interventions and improving hospice utilization. All right, so that's our foundation for palliative. Now we kind of all have a good understanding of what it can do and how we use it. So I want to introduce you to a really vulnerable patient population we're going to spend the rest of our time talking about. We're going to call it SPMI, but that's short for Severe Persistent Mental Illness. Now this affects approximately 6% of the population and we're going to loosely define it as mental illness that is chronic or recurrent, that requires ongoing intensive psychiatric treatment, and that significantly impairs functioning. Now we know that patients who suffer from SPMI um, it's associated with premature mortality across every age group. And in fact, the studies show that patients die an average of 25 years earlier than people who do not have SPMI. Why? Can any of you guys think of some ideas why that might be the case? What are these patients dying early from? Quality of life Medical suffers. Illnesses. Medical illnesses. You guys are smart. A lot of people think that these patients are dying due to some reason associated with their mental illness, their psychosis, violence, uh, suicide, unpredictable behavior. This is not the case. Um, predominantly, these patients are dying from chronic illness, um, things like heart disease, COPD, cancer. Um, they're not dying because they have mental illness for the most part. Um, so you would think, you know, one might assume that if people with SPMI have increased rates of chronic illness and die earlier, that they would be our highest users of palliative services. That could not be further from the truth. Um, guys, there are some major disparities for patients with SPMI and how they get to utilize palliative medicine. Let's take a look. Um, so provision is poor in spite of increased morbidity and mortality. There was a study that came out in 2016 that showed that patients with schizophrenia were found to access palliative care at approximately half the rate of their, of their peers that do not have schizophrenia. That is significant. That's not 10%. That's half um, the ability to get that care. Um, and, that, and at the same time, sadly, the con, when people have these terminal illnesses and also have SPMI, towards the end of their illnesses, their contact with their psychiatry provider also decreases. There was a nursing home study that showed a 24% odds reduction of a resident having any form of medical advance directive if they suffer from mental illness. And that one said mental illness. It didn't say even specifically SPMI. So there's some pretty significant disparities there. Um, and if this quote reads your mind, if you're thinking, well, that's unacceptable, um, you're not alone. There was actually an editorial that came out in 2017 of a, a team of psychiatrists and palliative specialists that, that said this is absolutely unacceptable, and they called for collaboration to resolve those things. 
So, all right, we know there's disparities. Why are there disparities? Let's take a look at what's going on or what we think is going on. Um, you know, a lot of what palliative does assumes that the patient has a stable home environment, stable care providers, access to certain resources, and as we know, as, you know, if we treat these patients with SPMI, that is simply not the case for a lot of them. So that makes it difficult. Um, also, medical providers presume that people who live with SPMI just don't have decision-making capacity. Data doesn't support this. Um, studies show that people, uh, you know, in relative uh, spaces of remission uh, with their psychotic illness, or stabilization at least, are often capable of participating in end-of-life decisions. And this is an important thing that we can contribute to as in psychiatry because we know that capacity is not one global judgment. It's not one or done. Yes, you have capacity or no, you don't have capacity. Capacity is assessed in spheres. So there may be a schizophrenic patient, for example, who isn't really capable of contributing to financial decisions, for example. Um, but they're more than capable in participating in a conversation about what kind of medication they may want or what they might want as they approach the end of their lives suffering from chronic heart disease. So it's not a one-time thing, remember that. And then these patients do require practitioners to help them navigate some pretty complex decisions in spite of uh, their deficits. And sometimes if people don't have the training in working with patients with SPMI, this can be daunting and often it just gets kind of set aside, unfortunately. So the mental illness itself is a barrier. Um, Non-psychiatric physicians may feel inadequately trained to disclose and communicate this kind of information, but on the other side, we as psychiatrists often don't feel really equipped to talk with our SPMI patients about palliative care services. So we may be less likely, even though we're more than qualified, to introduce an advanced care directive concept, for example, with an SPMI patient. And then also there are times where new medical or neuropsychiatric symptoms just get attributed to the person's mental illness when really there's something else going on. And I put in quotes up here, that bipolar lady. I wanted to tell you guys about a patient that I was involved with um, as a medical student when I was on my sub I in fourth year. And uh, she was, her admitting diagnosis was pneumonia and that was being treated. Uh, the team was doing a good job, but for whatever reason in rounds and you know how we come to know patients right or wrong, they always referred to her as that bipolar lady because it was on her problem list. Now she was well into her 70s and her bipolar disorder had been stable on the same medication for a long time. Bipolar was not a part of this hospitalization, but that's how they referred it to her. And I really think that's the reason that when she started to have some paranoia and some increased um, just odd behavior and then eventually some hallucinations, that workup for delirium and subsequent etiology for that delirium was missed for several days. And she ended up having a massive abdominal infection and she did not have a good prognosis. Who's to say, but maybe if we hadn't just seen her as that bipolar lady, we would have paid more attention to those symptoms. All right, let's talk about advanced care planning because I think it's important and I'll say more about it as we go on. Um, but regardless of whether a patient has severe persistent mental illness or not, um, we all kind of have the same concerns when it comes to thinking about the end of life. And we know that advanced care planning is just a huge vital component of what palliative care offers. They're very comfortable with it, um, but we need to be too, again, because of those disparities. Um, what are the things that people worry about? SPMI or not, people are all worried about fear of physical pain, fear of dying alone, and some sort of hope for some degree of self-determination. Easily addressed, no matter the person. All right, so we know there's disparities. We know there's barriers. What are we going to do about them? Um, there is a call for increased collaboration. Um, there was a data, there was a poll of mental health providers in the community and specifically psychiatry residents um, who expressed a very strong desire for additional training in palliative medicine. Um, if you are a practicing clinician, raise your hand if you had extensive palliative training. Yeah. So I had a two-week rotation in medical school and I feel like um, that changed everything about what I know. And so there's a call for even more of this. I feel like that uh, was the exception, not the rule, as far as the training we get in medical school about these services. So definitely a call for more training. And in the meantime, we need to do just more cross-collaboration, call up our peers, ask them the hard questions, and help kind of get over these barriers to better serve these patients. 
All right, so that was part one. You know, what are the disparities? How can we help the SPMI patients who suffer from chronic life-limiting illnesses? But as I got down the rabbit hole, I started to kind of ask myself the question, okay, well, if palliative is really great and really beneficial for these illnesses, is there room for a palliative approach for an SPMI patient who doesn't have a life-limiting medical comorbidity? Hmm. Not a new idea. I thought I was like coming up with something great, but apparently uh, this is something that has been emerging for the last quite a few years, since really 2013-ish. Um, mostly from what I read, led by a group of um, uh, Primarily the head, head guy, Dr. Manuel Troxel, um, Scott Irwin, also a palliative care specialist on this team. These guys are, are based in uh, University of Zurich in Switzerland, which shouldn't come as a surprise. They're, I think, far above and ahead um, in their views on palliative care. Uh, but they, they decided, I think I skipped one. They decided to come up with a new working definition of what that might be, of palliative psychiatry it looks a lot like the World Health Organization definition for palliative medicine, with the exception of the addition of the piece in orange, which is basically just, you can read it, it focuses on harm reduction and avoidance of burdensome psychiatric interventions with questionable impact. Um, so they decided to just do a philosophical adventure experiment, where they assessed how practicing psychiatrists might feel about this question. So they did a cross-sectional survey, they sent out to 1,311 German-speaking Swiss psychiatrists, that's very specific, um, to just assess, and they asked in a survey some questions about um, severe persistent mental illness and their patients that, that have that, and then also they presented three case vignettes of three very different patients, each with a very different kind of SPMI, and asked them three questions to see whether or not they agreed or disagreed. It was really interesting, and I thought that we could go through it today. And as we do that, I'm going to present you these case vignettes. I want you to really try to picture each of these patients in your mind's eye. Get a view of what they look like, how they live, what their quality of life is, and really try to kind of see that patient as though they were sitting in front of you. And then we're going to ask ourselves the same questions that the, the responders were asked. And I want you to see how you feel about it. You might be surprised. A lot of words here. Um, First case is a 37-year-old female with anorexia. She was diagnosed at age 11. So this is a woman who, for the quarter, better part of a quarter of a century, has been struggling with this debilitating illness. Um, general muscle weakness, loss of bone density, which you might uh, imagine. Current weight of 52 pounds. Uh, no recent weight gains, no stabilization, but also no acute danger because her body has kind of acclimated to living this way for 20 seven, six years. Um, she's been hospitalized 10 times in various settings, three of which were specialized in psychiatric institutions. Uh, throughout the course of her disease, she's had different intense psychotherapies, uh, no success. When she was hospitalized, she was forced to undergo several artificial refeedings, even under sedation, which is a common practice I did not know. Um, and she's now refusing artificial refeeding and treatment. She says that for years her life has been focused exclusively on fighting this illness and she is done. She suffers from physical symptoms we've already mentioned, um, but basically says, yeah, she would rather die than undergo further treatment and she just wants to be left in peace. All of this fighting and treatment has left her basically with nothing. She has no, no friends, um, no quality of life, and she doesn't want to be forced into eating anymore. Two independent experts assessed her and declared that she has decision-making capacity to refuse further treatment, even with consequent risk of death. Can we see this woman? Sad, right? All right, second case, very different. 33-year-old male with schizophrenia, um, diagnosed at 17. No significant comorbidities. So positive and negative symptoms, all rated severe. You can read them there. Um, Long-lasting, high-dose pharmacological treatment, including combinations of just about every drug class that you can name. Uh, no avail, no remission of symptoms. He has never been free, even with ECT, from the positive or the negative symptoms of his illness. He's had psychotherapies of various kinds. Nothing has stabilized him or improved his quality of life. And he doesn't wish to continue 
the assertive community treatment that he's getting because he feels it's just too intrusive. Um, he's 33 years old. He doesn't want it. Now, while his positive symptoms were more dominant in the first years as his life went on, he began to develop se severe negative symptoms, um, even to the point that he exudes exertion or exertion, aggressive behavior, and even self-injury. He burns himself with cigarettes. The negative symptoms, um, strong functional deficits are made worse. He's chronically unemployed. He cannot live independently. He has no family system to speak of. And his persisting illness has left him completely isolated with no social contacts, no hobbies, no interests. And again, two experts independently assessed him and found that he has decision-making capacity in respect for his illness and treatment. We see this guy? Last one, case three. So 40-year-old 40, 40 male with major depressive disorder and no significant medical comorbidities. His symptoms include what you might expect, energy loss, insomnia, fatigue, and persistent suicidal ideation for over 20 years of his life. He has current acute and concrete suicidal intent. He underwent different intensive evidence-based long-term psychotherapies including specialized treatment approaches, and his depression was not improved either by psychotherapy alone or in combination, again, with adequate treatment trials of every major drug class, including combinations. The patient experienced significant adverse effects with a lot of these medications, as many of our patients do. Um, as a last resort, he did try ECT, but the ongoing maintenance therapy actually proved ineffective and even increased some of his suicidal ideations. His symptoms worsened. Um, he experiences severe hopelessness, states his quality of life is very poor, and he also does not want to deal with his illness anymore. He intends to commit suicide in the near future. Two independent experts have declared that he possesses decision-making capacity regarding his illness and its treatment. Can we see these patients? Have we seen these patients, some of them? All right. So I want you to kind of assess as we go through these questions how you feel. This is what the responders were asked. Statement number one, with regard to the anorexic case, the schizophrenic case, and the major depression case. The statement is, I would not be surprised if this patient died within the next six months. Strongly disagree to strongly agree. You think about your answer. And let's see what responders said. Not so sure about the patient with schizophrenia, but fairly confident at least um, with that the anorexic patient and the major depressive patient uh, could be facing demise within the next six months. Okay. Next statement. For this patient, further interventions to cure the disease will most likely be futile. Strongly disagree? Agree. A little bit different here, but still a similar trend. With the anorexic patient, good, good bar sticking above the rest says that a lot of people agree with that. Um, in the major depressive case, a lot of people strongly agree with that. And we're not so sure with the schizophrenic patient. All right, last statement. In this case, I would be comfortable with reduction of life expectancy in order to increase or maintain quality of life if that is consistent with the patient's goals. Do we disagree or do we agree? So for each of these patients, we kind of, the responders anyway, I don't know about we yet, but they agree with the anorexia, anorexia patient, with the schizophrenic patient, and with the major depressive patient. A little bit more balance there though. So I don't know about you guys, but when I read through these case vignettes and really tried to picture these patients in my mind, I was more comfortable with these statements with one of these patients than I was with the others. And we'll talk about that in a minute. Um, so just some other results in the general survey. The reduction of suffering um, was considerably more important in the treatment of SPMI than impeding suicide or curing the underlying illness for these responders broad agreement that SPMI can be terminal and that in some cases approaches may be futile. 
And more than 75% were in favor of some kind of palliative approach for these patients. Now again, that's 1,311 surveys and close to 400 people responded. Um, but that's what they thought. So, okay, this is a small sample. I mean, it's still a good chunk of people, almost 400 people, but it's a select group. It's German-speaking Swiss psychiatrists. So hard to really generalize that, especially across the pond. Um, and, you know, the question that I had is, would palliative patients even be okay with this? Um, or would SPMI patients be okay with saying, hey, we're going to adopt a palliative approach? And I'm thinking in America, given those earlier misconceptions that we talked about, um, maybe not as much, um, because oftentimes palliative is confused with giving up. So that's, that's something to ask ourselves. And then what services are we even talking about here? That was my big question. Everybody talks about a palliative approach with SPMI, but I found few people who were willing to actually provide some examples for what that might even mean in terms of changes in treatment. And as I said before, I find a lot of what we do in psychiatry to be inherently palliative. So that needs to be explored. Um, and then also, how do we identify patients who could benefit from a palliative approach? Who gets to do that? In that diagram that I gave you that was kind of over time, a mix of disease modifying versus palliative care, who gets to decide when we switch that for our SPMI, SPMI patients? These are important questions, I think. Um, so one of the, the things that I read said that clinical staging can help. Now, if we've done any amount of medicine, we know that we stage a lot of terminal medical illnesses. We stage it in cancer, we stage it in heart disease, we stage it in um, really COPD, all kinds of pulmonary issues. We have stages of these illnesses and they follow a pretty common trajectory. And that staging helps us determine the kind of treatment that we offer those patients. So people suggest, well, let's stage SPMI. If I line 10 patients up here with schizophrenia or major depression, can you predict the same trajectory for all of them? If you can, you are so much better than me. Um, we know with mental illness that everybody's different in how they experience and how they progress, even with SPMI. This would be very difficult to do, but it is, it is an idea. Um, and we've already talked about that. So staging really shouldn't be defined by response to treatment. It really should be used to guide treatment. And with SPMI, I don't, I don't know that we could necessarily achieve that. Um, and that's my question. When, how, and who gets to decide futility here with these patients? Um, because we all know, again, every patient has a different experience. And at what point does somebody get to push that button and say, we're there? Um, so more on futility, experts agree, not with me, with each other, because they had these thoughts a long time before I did. Um, but there's a woman um, who's in Mayo Clinic in Rochester. She's a palliative expert, and she says the same thing. Uh, for patients with an SPMI and no life-limiting comorbidity, it becomes extremely complicated to attempt to define futility. Um, moreover, and this is something else that she brought up that I had not considered, um, Medicare and insurance providers uh, do not currently define any psychiatric illness as terminal. So who's going to pay for it? That's a huge question, especially in our culture. Um, so <laughs> interestingly enough, the, the group that, tried, that did the survey in Switzerland tried to come over and replicate their survey in America. Um, they presented uh, unpublished results, but at the APA meeting in May of 2017, um, he pulled a thousand psychiatrists randomly how many do you think responded? Anybody want to guess? 20%? Anybody else? 50%? 50 people. Give me one more. One more guess out of 1,000. Probably 10%. 10%. Man in the back says zero. One dollar. Price is right. 60. 60 people responded. Krupa, you get a prize. I'll. I don't know what it is. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> 60 people out of 1,000. So that already tells you um, we've got some resistance to some of these questions in our, in our country, at least, at least in that scenario. I don't know. But the people who did respond did agree that improving function in daily life was important for these patients. And 92% said reducing suffering was important. Only two-thirds ranked important patient autonomy. Um, but... The people who he presented to at the APA meeting and the responders did voice general support for the underlying concepts of promoting quality of life, decision-making autonomy of some degree, 
and palliative care targeted at the medical illnesses. So we all feel comfortable saying that people who have SPMI but also have heart disease, COPD, cancer, uh, renal failure should get palliative care. We're comfortable in that sandbox. Um, when we step over to start to talk about exclusive palliative services without those medical illnesses, we got a long way to go and a lot to discuss and think about. All right, so takeaways for us today. Um, really just wanted to bring some of those questions up for just some thought-provoking things. It's not anything that I'd really ever thought about. Want to continue this dialogue and discussion um, and, and really kind of get these ideas out there to begin to think about as you face your patients and sit in front of patients and their families with severe persistent mental illness. But there are some takeaways. So let's go back to those disparities. That's where, that's the sandbox we feel comfortable in. Um, psychiatrists are, guys, that we are extremely well positioned to help patients gain greater access to palliative care and end of life planning. Um, for these patients, remember, it, it is not, it is very overwhelming for people who are not trained in communicating with SPMI patients sometimes to help communicate these, these things with those, that patient group. We can help. Um, also because they often follow with psychiatry so much more than any PCP provider, we know this. Um, we need to engage our patients during times of relative wellness and encourage them and their families, their caregivers, to discuss end-of-life desires and plans and help them create formal health care directives. Now, this was something I learned in my palliative rotation, regardless of mental illness or not. Um, in primary care, we need to be talking to patients about advanced care, about what their wishes are. Um, the big thing to remember, if you wait until the end stage of a life-limiting illness to talk about the end stage, it's too late. And, and if, you, if you decide as soon as a patient is diagnosed to start engaging them in conversations about what could happen and how they feel about it, early on, um, we have a lot better chance at really getting these patients the services that they need. How many of you feel completely comfortable walking through, communicating about, and executing an advanced directive for a patient? How many of you have done it? Okay, that's about what I expected. Um, as it turns out, you don't even have to be a medical doctor to do this. In the state of Tennessee, you need the patient and a notary public or two competent adults. Now, you, you don't have to be a medical doctor, but you do have to understand the form. And you do have to be able to communicate it to a patient with any literacy level, and I would say even more so if they have severe persistent mental illness um, to them and their families. You have to be able to communicate it well, but you can do it. And we ought to be able to do this and have some degree of comfort level doing it. Um, the document belongs to the patient and can be changed and revised as needed. And again, advanced directive conversations need to evolve over time. Um, I put this up here. You can actually go to uh, tn.gov health. You can Google advanced care directive in Tennessee. It's very easy. I'm going to show it to you. <laughs> and I would encourage you uh, sooner rather than later to at least look at it. And if you don't have one or your family members don't have one, think about that too. Um, so here it is, advanced directive forms, English, that's the language I speak, and boom. So it's not overly complicated, just some of the wording is a little confusing. And you go through it, and then they sign it, and they take it with them. Now, I'm not going to read it to you, and we're not going to go through it, but I've got some ideas about what we ought to do. Um, you can decide for yourself. This is not something I would have been comfortable with before I did a palliative medicine rotation. Um, they do these all day, every day, and after just two weeks with, the, um, with Dr. Baumarker, I was completely confident um, executing this form. Even as a medical student, he had me doing them. It's not hard, it's just different. So we need to educate ourselves. And I would really encourage you, we are fortunate to have some really excellent palliative providers in our area, um, both in the community and at the VA. Get in touch with them. Say, hey, this form doesn't make sense to me, or I'm not comfortable with it, and I've got some patients that I sure would like to help out and introduce this to. Can you walk me through it? In fact, can you do one with me? How would you go through it with a patient? And from what I know about our palliative care specialists, they would jump at the chance uh, to help a colleague understand this form and help more people get on board with being comfortable with it. 
Um, and again, it simply has to be witnessed by a notary or two competent adults. And I'll let you decide what competent means. Um, <laughs> all right. Oh, I gotta get off my. No. Okay. So some concluding thoughts. This advanced staging thing, I would not want to be tasked with in severe persistent mental illness, but I do think it bears some thought and I think there may be some utility in it um, in de determining kind of at least broad trajectories. Um, just kind of remains to be determined. And it is essential that people, people broadly and clinicians don't confuse palliative care with giving up or abandoning a patient with any type of terminal illness. These patients can still get all kinds of treatment. And somebody even suggested in my reading, these ought to be the patients that we're doing psychedelic research with and more, you know, more aggressive things. There's all kinds of things, but it's not giving up. And then again, the supporters of the palliative approach, Troxel's group and the other groups that are, that are coming on board with this line of thinking, really do need to elaborate more specifically about what kind of services that we're talking about, how it might be utilized, um, really with an emphasis on preventing futile and burdensome interventions um, over medication and improved quality of life. Some of the ideas I did find, um, people suggested, as you might imagine, maybe more relaxed use of agents like benzos, um, withdrawal of care at the patient's insistence if they're deemed to have capacity, and intermittent sedation. This is something that's done routinely in palliative care with things like intractable pain. Somebody suggested it for SPMI. Um, switching to a patient with end-stage anorexia to hospice care instead of force feeding. So uh, coming back to our three patients, I found um, that I was far more comfortable discussing prognosis and palliative approach with the anorexic patient than I was with the other two. Um, can anybody, anybody share or feel or agree, disagree with that? Agreed. Agreed? Okay. And I, I thought about why that was, and I think it's because we have this illness with so many physical signs of deterioration. Um, we see so much more of the head down piece happening to her. And I think I just feel a lot more comfortable with the idea that she might not want um, any more treatment. You had a thought? Yes, I actually um, felt more comfortable with the major depressive patients. Okay. And that's because for me the quality, I think it depends on what we hold valuable at our core and mm -hmm. what our egos can handle to a certain extent. Because medically we can justify saying, okay, we're actually helping them out. But psychiatrically, there's a little bit of that, I'm either a crappy doctor because I didn't help them, or you bring into question your own value system. Mm -hmm. So I think that's kind of where blurs the line for euthanasia for a lot of providers. Mm -hmm. it, I feel like this would be a polarizing thing for them as well. Absolutely. So it's just, I think, your perspective. And that, that is the key right there. So Geetha said she would be more comfortable with a major depressive patient and a palliative approach. And so that's the problem. It really does depend on what your values are and what you're comfortable with um, and what bothers you the most. I think it's a sticky subject. So right now, a lot of philosophical thought, but such different trajectories of illness for these patients. Um, hard, to, hard to think about. Um, so bottom line here today, guys, is, is that we know that whether a patient needs palliative services for some sort of um, life-limiting comorbid issue, like heart failure or COPD or renal failure, or whether it's the mental illness itself that has advanced to a level that you begin to think they could use a palliative approach, there's a lot more exploration that can be done at this place, at this intersection where palliative and psychiatry meet. And I really think that the more we engage in that place and the more we sit in that location and really kind of put our collective uh, minds towards that exploration, um, maybe we really may be able to produce some, who knows, some kind of hybridized care model that could really better serve what is an incredibly vulnerable population and can better serve their families and can really better serve the healthcare system that supports all of that. So a, a lot ahead. I really just wanted to provide it to you today to just kind of start thinking about it. But the big piece is that advanced directive. If we're not talking about that with our patients, I just want to implore you to remember that they may not be following with a primary care doctor and we can't assume that somebody else is having those discussions. And those are important things when they're feeling better, not in the last days of their lives. So, questions, thoughts? I can probably talk loud enough. <laughs> so, yeah, I don't want to drink too much stuff on this. Um, so, a couple of comments, um, maybe a question. So, 
Jim Levinson, the paper you uh, quoted over there, the first article, was actually my can't, can't hear you. Oh, can't hear. Okay. Microphone. Yes, I'll just take the microphone. <laughs> I was just saying Jim Levinson, uh, one of the authors of that first uh, general hospital, he's actually still at Virginia Commonwealth University where I trained, and he's the CL uh, division head. Um, one of the things that I wanted to comment on is that, you know, you talked about the Europe uh, assessment and then the attempt at assessing the US. I think there's two issues here. One is, and I think someone might have done a grand rounds on this before, there were some discussions around it, but liability. Mm -hmm. is a big issue in the U.S. Yes. So I think you're going to find that people are going to be, A, hesitant to even make a comment, <laughs> voice it, and two, that's what keeps people hesitant to have some of these conversations. Um, the other component is, in Europe, there's a different view, as you pointed out, perhaps to death, mm -hmm. and choices in death. So when the discussion was made about choosing suicide for people, uh, one of the things that did you know, was discussed or was raised, and I know this has happened, is for some people who want to kill themselves in Europe, and I could tell you exactly where in Europe it was, not, not sure if it was uh, German-speaking Swiss, <laughs> um, that they didn't always have to see a psychiatrist to determine if this was within a capacity realm. Mm. They were able to see a primary care physician, sometimes only one, who could okay this. So that's a pretty scary thought. When I read that, I was very concerned about mm -hmm. this. Um, so that's one thing I think is important in being able to make sure that they have had, in fact, at least two psychiatrists or you know, well-trained people who are in, able to um, assess capacity and, and really see if all options mm -hmm. had been, because what their definition of, of uh, trials and treatment were like, maybe two or three trials and that's, you know, not even necessarily CT, et cetera. Uh, so that's one thing that I was concerned about. The other thing was, um, you know, I, I like the fact that you talked about the issue of a living will for not just medical, but kind of for psychiatric in a way. So that would, I think, make a lot of sense. And the, the last, I guess, request I had was to maybe try to clarify the definitions of hospice and palliative. Mm -hmm. and I think people do don't necessarily have clarity. Mm -hmm. you're, no, you're absolutely right. It is often confused. And I will admit, before I did that rotation, I kind of thought they were synonyms. Um, you know, hospice, as we know, is, is a diagnosis that is really kind of predicted to, to end life within six months. It's a very different um, shift. It's kind of, you're, you're not really doing as much of the disease-modifying treatment, whereas palliative can be brought on very early and is, is all kinds of different kind of more life-modifying services in a team approach. Well, first of all, kudos on an excellent presentation. <laughs> Thank you. Um, some of you might remember a number of years ago, Mark Comrade came yes. and gave a very passionate grand rounds here on the topic of uh, physician assisted, um, basically euthanasia for psychiatric. Okay. The same thing she was bringing up. Mm -hmm. He's um, very concerned about this, and he's one of the people running right now for a trustee at large of ADA, by the way. And anyway, I know him really well, and he t sends me emails. I just got one yesterday. Um, so Belgium and yeah. the Netherlands and now Canada mm -hmm. are uh, approving euthanasia for people that only have a psychiatric problem, and hundreds of people have been killed mm -hmm. by their doctors in Belgium and the Netherlands. And so he um, spearheaded this effort by the APA. He's an ethicist mm -hmm. to declare that it's not ethical for um, physicians to kill their psychiatric patients. And I guess my, my comment is people who, the, that last case, the suicidal person, I mean, that's the patients we treat. Mm -hmm. And how many times have you seen a patient whose whole life turned around after being suicidal because of things in their life that changed? Yes. So how can you, how can you decide it's time to give up on that person? Mm -hmm. And I think kind of inherently in what we do, giving up is not, uh, doesn't sit well with us as providers, and I don't think it should. And so, you know, inevitably the idea of physician-assisted suicide was going to come up today, and I think, um, man, that conversation gives me the heebie-jeebies. I'm just going to say I just have so many mixed feelings about it. That was a good clinical word, wasn't it? Um, uh, yeah, I, I heard Mark Comrade speak at the Southern Psychiatric last year, very eloquent speaker, very well-spoken. Uh, 
I'm on his email list too and follow him. He's I wish we could get him back here. He's just a terrific speaker. Oh, I'm gonna see him soon, Owen. Oh please do. <laughs> Uh, since he's running for office, I'm sure he'll speak anyway. <laughs> <laughs> but he, uh, he's on the staff of Tulane, too. And uh, Back in the 80s, I was practicing in New Orleans when we had deinstitutionalization. I'm sure, Mary, you remember that. Um, so rather than in being in long-term psychiatric care, they, they took to the streets, and they were homeless after that. So you'd mm -hmm. see them on every street corner in New Orleans, the chronic schizophrenics and such. Uh, that was also the time when the Russians were trying to get in the World Psychiatric Association. And we pointed our finger at the Russians and said, well, you, you just lock people up and throw away the key. And the Russian says, well, is that more humane than what you do is let them become homeless and unmedicated? So, you know, it, you had to stop and think, which way is more humane when we're right in the middle of this battle? Um, so, uh, I, nice talk. I, I, Cut the tail end of it. Sorry, <laughs> hear the it's first okay. part. Um, but there's definitely food for thought. If, mm -hmm. if you guys are interested, Mark Conrad with a K, and he uh, he's a real interesting fellow. He writes uh, a lot. So if you're interested in these issues, check him out. So, so overall, really, I, spoiler, I should have said a spoiler alert in the beginning. I have no answers. I have no easy answers for you about this, but here's what I will say. If my bipolar patient, my depressive patient, my, my any mental illness patient is sitting in front of me and I learn that they have an ejection fraction of 15% or are only using 30% of their lung capacity, um, you can bet after going down this rabbit hole that I am going to be a lot more concerned about making sure that they get good palliative care and be proactive about contacting our excellent providers in this area. So I just want to encourage you to think about that as well. So, Thank you, Dr. Roby. Oh. Thank you.